Thank you, Lord. Come on, Jerry. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That really ministered to me about Joseph Prince. I know Joseph Prince, and I love him, and he's a man of God, and I get tired of hearing people yap, yap about him. Amen. And uh, it's, it's wonderful and fresh to my heart and to my ears to hear good things. Didn't that bless you? Didn't that just bless you to hear that? Praise God. Amen. And let that be a powerful word to all in this room and to, to, to all that will hear these messages. Amen. It's good news. It's good news. Good news. And like somebody said to Brother Hagin said, well, you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't say something bad about the devil. He said, well, he is a persistent cuss. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. We ready. All right. <laughs> Turn me loose. Father, we, we receive Brother Jerry. Mm. Thank you, Lord. My, 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 my. And we thank you for his life. And thank you for his ministry. I, uh, we were in a hotel one time. And it was, <laughs> it might as well have been just one great big room because you could hear through the walls, man. I mean, and, and Gloria and I, are lying there in the bed listening to a couple of members of our staff just running up, running us up and down the wall. And we're on the road, you know. We're sitting there listening to that. And there was a knock on the door, or not on mine, but on there. And Jerry, I, I, I heard, recognize Jerry's voice. So uh, they immediately, you know, began to dump on Jerry and began to ask him what he thought. Whoa, big mistake. <laughs> I mean, I mean they, they got the same kind of message we got here this afternoon. Only Jerry was a whole lot rougher about it. <laughs> I said, listen to my boy. <laughs> Listen to my boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God forever. And that's the way you and I ought to be. And, and I, I don't really care uh, about whom they're speaking. I mean, that, that, that just, don't be, just don't be doing that. Amen. Amen. Are you okay? Yes. That was kind of weak. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you awake? Yeah. Amen. Give Brother Jerry a welcome to this pup form. Go ahead and be seated. before the week was up. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Everybody happy? Smile real big and let somebody think you're happy. And then go ahead and tell them, I really am happy. Amen. Getting happier by the moment. I want you to listen to something that 
I've asked them to play. I don't have a video clip of it, but we have the audio. And I want you to listen to this just before I ask you to turn in your Bibles, because it has everything to do with what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So, gentlemen, go ahead and play yeah, that. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I understand that. That's I understand name. that. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, uh, Ken Copeland, he said, you're going to have to turn yourself up now. You're going to have to move over there into that healing ministry a little faster than you thought you would because you see the time is short. And there was a time that you could wait and sort of get ready for some things. You're not jumping, I can so money, jumping out ahead of God. You're keeping step with God. And you're going to have to put some more emphasis in, 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 in some of these areas in which you know to do so, particularly in the area of the healing ministry. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, Lord. And uh, whether you want to or not, <laughs> you're going to operate in the ministry of the prophet. The seer. The seer. It's standing right in the pulpit. You'll see right in front of your eyes just like a sort run off on a television screen. You'll be able to minister to the people. Now you're going to get a lot of persecution from some friends. Some's going to draw back from you. But those fair weather friends are not worth it. Go on with God. Jesus is coming. It's better to stand in his presence and say, I've not been disobedient. <laughs> Hallelujah to Jesus. And now I separate you by the dir direction of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. By the authority invested in me as a prophet of God, I, 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 I separate you unto the call of God. And now the anointing of God's power and spirit comes upon you. And there, and by faith, we impart unto you by the direction of him who is the head of the church, the power, the gifts, the endowment, the endowment that's necessary to equip you to stand in that office. And though you start at the bottom of the ladder as you climb upward, upward, ever upward, that ministry shall grow and grow and grow. And men shall come to know. And many who sat in darkness shall rejoice because they shall see the light. And a blessing unto many shalt thou be. And in that day, many, many more shall rise up and call thee blessed. And thou shalt have cause for much rejoicing. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. That was the day that Kenneth Hagin laid hands on Brother Copeland and set him into the office of the prophet. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20 and the latter part of that verse, Believe ye in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. I have been associated with Brother Copeland coming up very shortly, 50 years. He's prophesied over me many times. And I can say without reservation that every time he has prophesied over me that it eventually came to pass just like he said it. It didn't happen overnight. Most of the time it's been months, sometimes years, one time even 20 years before it came to pass. But not one time has he ever laid his hands on me and prophesied. And he's done it quite frequently, particularly in believers conventions I've done over the years. He'd introduce me and start to walk off and say, wait a minute, Jerry, the word of the Lord's come to me. And he'd begin to prophesy over me. And uh, I would go to the, I'd have someone go to the uh, sound people and ask them, did you record that? And usually they always did. So I'd get a copy of it, take it back to my office, have my secretary transcribe it, put a copy in my notebook, 
Many times my art department would take it and put it in some beautiful lettering and frame it and put it in my office. So every time I'd walk by it, I could read it and decree it and believe that it would come to pass. I'm acting on what 2 Chronicles 20, 20 said, believe his prophets and you will prosper. God will take you to another level. Can you say amen? amen. Now, Kenneth Hagin prophesied over Carol and I numerous times. Everything Brother Hagin said came to pass. First time I had the privilege of meeting Oral Roberts, within first five minutes, he laid his hands on me and prophesied. And it came to pass. So I believe in the prophetic ministry. It didn't go away with the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. It's part of the fivefold ministry. Amen. Prophets. The Bible says, and God sets prophets in the church as he pleases. Amen. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the book of Amos, that God does nothing except he first reveal it to his servants, the prophets. Amen. So when Brother Copeland in particular, because the other men I mentioned, they're already in heaven. But when Brother Copeland stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, my antenna goes up. I start writing what he says. Not only that, but like I said, we, we take it home with us, have it printed up, put it on my desk, put it in my home, uh, put it everywhere that I'm most likely to be frequently. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So he that reads it can run with it. I'm running with this year, 2019, the year of the harvest. That's what he prophesied. Say it with me. 2019, the year of abundant harvest. I mean, if you could stand some abundant harvest. Amen. Now, what the Lord's instructed me to talk about today is that abundant harvest, the lost seed time and harvest. And one of the things that came up in my spirit was you hear this quite often from people. I've even said it. You've probably said it. Well, it's all in God's timing. It's all in God's timing. Well, when God specifically says through the prophet, it's now this year, isn't that God's timing? So can I go around and tell people if I choose, this is my year for abundant harvest. I said, this is my year for abundant harvest. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe I do. Most of you got a lot of seed in the ground. Amen. I've got a lot of seed in the ground. Carol and I are not only, uh, you know, givers, but we are aggressive sowers. We live to give. That's one of our favorite things to do is sow. We don't do it, you know, just when we're in a meeting. We, we, we get up every morning. Paul said, be mindful to be a blessing. Carolyn wrote a book a number of years ago, Born to Be a Blessing. We're mindful to be a blessing. We pray, God, lead us somewhere where we can be a blessing. Lead us to someone we can be a blessing to. And it doesn't always have to be finances. You know, sometimes it's just a kind word, an encouraging word. That's a seed. Sometimes it's just a pat on the back and say, you're going to make it. That's a seed. Amen. Everything we say, everything we do is a seed. So, and we don't exclude finances. Of course, we, we give finances uh, quite often. Amen. So I've got a lot of seed in the ground. And now I have something to rest my faith on. That harvest time, abundant harvest time, is going to take place this year. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout. I think somebody ought to shout, hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout a little bit louder. Hallelujah. I think somebody ought to top that and really shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now go with me to Galatians chapter six. And some of this, you know, some of it you've never heard. You hear it here first. <laughs> Galatians chapter six. 
And look at verse 6. Let him that is taught in the Lord, or taught in the Word, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And the word communicate there literally means to <clears throat> give or to sow. And even a stronger word is partner with. Let him that is taught in the Word give, sow, partner with him that teacheth in all things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So it appears to me that Paul is talking about sowing and reaping. Would you agree? Yes. Sowing and reaping. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... Now, if you haven't underlined that phrase, do so right now. Highlight it, put it in your notes. In due season, we shall reap. Now, it's not a question of whether or not we will reap. We shall reap. But in God's timing, <laughs> as most people would say. Due season. So notice he says, For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good. And he's still talking about sowing unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The message translation uses the phrase for due season at the right time. Write that down. At the right time, we will receive harvest from seeds we sow. The Amplified says at the appointed time. Write that down. At the appointed time. Now the word appointed <clears throat> means fixed, set, established, ordained, or allotted time. I'll say that again. Appointed means fixed, set, established, ordained, and allotted time. Now another definition that I discovered in the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary, which I, I use quite often and I love it because it not only gives a definition, but it also gives scripture reference. I first come across this with uh, Stan Moore down in Miami years ago when Brother Moore blessed me with one of those, Jerry, his wife there. And uh, I've had it in my possession ever since. I take it nearly everywhere I go. And the great thing now is you can download it. I don't have, it's this thick, it's this big, so I don't have to carry it around like this anymore. You can download it. And I love the fact that it gives scripture references along with the definitions. So once again, this particular dictionary, 1828 Noah Webster, the definition it gives for appointed time, a decreed time, a decreed time. Now that really, that really went off in me. A decreed time. Say it with me. A decreed time. That's the same thing as an appointed time, the right time, or due season. A decreed time. And how does God normally go about decreeing something? Well, one of the ways is through the prophet's ministry. Amen. Amen. And the prophet has declared 2019. Amen. He's decreed as a mouthpiece for God that 2019 is the year of abundant harvest. Now, let me give you something just from some agricultural uh, things that just, you know, people that are involved in farming and so forth, they know this. Many of you may not know this. I'm just going to read it the way I wrote it down. Wheat crops. There are two seasonal wheat crops, spring wheat and winter wheat. Harvesting of winter wheat comes from mid-May till mid-July. So when the farmer... The wheat farmer sows his seed expecting a crop. 
then he knows in advance that between mid-May and mid-July, he will have a harvest. No question about it. No guesswork. He knows. Now, when you and I sow financial seeds, we don't always know when due season will come. But we do know it will come because Galatians 6 said, we will reap if we faint not. So we stand in faith waiting for that harvest time. Now, if most Christians knew that if they sowed today, that harvest would come mid-July, everybody would be sowing. No question about it. No concerns. No guesswork. We know harvest will be mid-July. And you probably would get all the seed in the ground that you possibly could. Can you say amen about that? But we don't always know when due season will be here. The appointed time, the right time, the allotted time, and the decreed time. Unless it's decreed, we couldn't know. And that's the reason that Paul said, if we faint not. In other words, don't ever give up. How many of you have been tempted to give up on your harvest? Well, in just a moment, I'll be cast out lying devils <laughs> because we've all experienced that at times where you thought this is never going to happen. It's never going to work. And one of the things that, that got me past that years ago was I read in Psalm 20 that God never forgets the seed sown. God never forgets the seed sown. I, I remember times when I experienced a harvest. I said, Lord, why'd you do that? He said, oh, that's that seed you sowed uh, that, into that missionary. When that missionary came to that church you were in and uh, they needed a, a van and they didn't have the money to buy the van. And you told them after the service, I'd like to buy that van for you. As soon as I get home, I'm going to sow the seed so you can buy that van. And I bought it just out of the goodness of my heart. I love what they did. Uh, I'd been with them on several occasions. Uh, I felt they were honorable people and I knew they would, they would use that van to the glory of God. So it was just a joy to be able to sow the van into their lives. I really wasn't thinking about harvest. You ever sowed seed and really didn't think about harvest? You just did it out of the goodness of your heart. You just, you just wanted to be a blessing. I wasn't even thinking about harvest. And then this thing manifested and it was big and it was, uh, you know, great. I said, Lord, why did you do that? He said, that's from that seed you sowed into those missionaries. I said, well, Lord, I never asked you for a harvest on that. He said, no, you didn't. But I never forget a seed sown. Amen. Now, we tend to forget, but he never does. Amen. Look in Psalm 20. It says he remembers your offerings. He never forgets the seed sown. So don't ever give up on your harvest. Amen. Now, once again, if we knew, like the wheat farmer knows, if I plant now, then about mid-July, mid-May to mid-July, it's harvest time. Then there'd be no problems in the body of Christ where sowing would be concerned. Everybody would be sowing. But the problem is they don't know when harvest time is. They don't know when it's coming. And some of them have waited and they didn't see a harvest. And so they gave up and eventually they get to the place where I'm not going to do that again. Well, you might as well just hold on to your seed with that kind of attitude. Amen. Now, another example, the corn farmer. The farmer that plants corn. Planting begins in April and continues through, or it takes, harvesting takes place in October and finishes by the end of November. Let me say that again. Corn is planted normally in the month of April. 
April, and continues through the month of June. That's planting time. Harvesting takes place in October and finishes up by the end of November. So the guy that plants corn, he knows when harvest time is here. So does that really take a whole lot of faith for the harvest? He knows in advance when harvest time is coming. Now, of course, he is operating in faith because he has to trust the soil, he has to trust the seed and so forth. But he has no questions about harvest time. It's coming. I know it's going to come either in October or at the latest, the end of November. Amen. Now, wouldn't it be great if we knew in advance? I said, wouldn't it be great if we knew in advance when harvest time is ready for us. Well, the prophet said. The prophet said. This is where that definition from the Noah Webster Dictionary comes in. Decreed time. The prophet, by God, through God, inspired by God, and I know Brother Colton, he doesn't just stand up and just shoot his mouth off, say things that, you know, thus saith the Lord, and then it doesn't have anything to do with what God wants to do. I know him better than that. You know him better than that. It wasn't just a thought that came up and, oh, I believe I'll say that. That sounds good for 2019. Yeah, the year of abundant harvest. That's not Kenneth Copeland. I know that. You know that. So why aren't we shouting in advance when we know in advance that this year is abundant harvest time? Amen. Now we don't always know in the natural when harvest time comes. But when God specifically speaks to the prophet and decrees it, then there's no room for doubt anymore. In fact, I get up every day ever since I heard. In fact, I look forward to the prophetic word that Brother Copeland has every year. And I not only look forward to what he says, I always compare it to what the Lord says to me and see how divinely linked it is because there's no contradiction in God. Amen. He said through Brother Copeland that it's the year of the abundant harvest. And the Lord said to me, uh, it'll be a year of marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of your God. I preached here a couple of weeks ago and showed how those two are divinely linked. God is going to bring about harvest in your life this year through marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of God. That means you're going to be astounded at how it comes. It's going to, it's going to come this year in ways you've never experienced before. Hallelujah. You know, in the ministry of Jesus, they said from time to time, after they saw a miracle he performed, We've seen strange things. The Bible says they were filled with wonder. They marveled. Well, he's still in the marvel, wonder, and extraordinary manifestation business. Hallelujah. And God is going to fill you with wonder this year. He's going to cause you to stand in awe, and you're going to ask from time to time, how in the world did God do it that way? Hallelujah. Don't limit God. Don't you never say, take the limits off God. Take limits off. Amen. Now, when Paul said, if we faint not, that means don't ever give up. So until we have this prophetic word, I wouldn't have known when my harvest would come. So I just made up my mind that having done all to stand, I'll stand. I've become an expert in that. I like to say, my name is Jerry. Having done all to stand, stand, Savelle. Because that, that's, that's how everything's worked for me. 
I've had to stand. Amen. Sometimes I just had to stand for a few hours, sometimes all day, sometimes a week, sometimes months, sometimes even 20 years. But when it finally came to pass, that was the shortest 20 years I ever spent in my life. I didn't think about how long it took because I was so excited over the fact that God did something that man said could not be done. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Now in the book of James, he compares uh, the farmer to the body of Christ watching for the appearing of the Lord. And he talks about uh, that we must remain patient. Everybody say patient. patient. And that's a word that most charismatics don't like. Patient. Our attitude has been sometimes, I've been patient enough. It's like when I first came to the Lord back in 69, uh, shortly after Brother Copeland left, and there was a couple of other preachers came to the church where Carolyn grew up in, and I started going to, and, and uh, you know, and I'm preparing for full-time ministry, shutting my business down, preparing for ministry, and, and uh, so if I had an opportunity, I'd go up and talk to them at the end of the service. And I'd say, uh, sir, do you mind me asking you how, how you got started in the ministry? Oh, just be patient, son. Just be patient. I said, okay. Then the next preacher came. I had an opportunity to ask him, uh, sir, do you mind if I ask you uh, how you got started in ministry? When do people start asking you to come and, and share what you've learned? Oh, just be patient, son. Just be patient. I told Carolyn, if the next preacher I ask that tells me to be patient, I'm going to slap him. <laughs> I've been patient enough. Now, when do things start happening? Isn't that the way we are about patience sometimes? You know, I've been patient long enough. But here James says, like the farmer is patient, waiting for that seed to germinate, waiting for that seed to sprout, waiting for that seed to grow, waiting for harvest time. He must be patient, even though he knows in advance when harvest time comes, but he still has to wait for it. He can't go out there the next day and say, this stuff doesn't work, dig up his seed and never attempt to do it again. He has to be patient. But here's another thing James said, and uh, you're not going to like it any more than you like patient. <laughs> he said in James 5, 7 and 8, long patience. <laughs> long patience. Oh boy, he just made it worse. Sometimes you have to be willing to wait long. <laughs> How many of you, everything you've ever believed God for came to pass within a few moments? <laughs> Anybody? If that's happened, I'm going to sit down and let you take over because I don't know anything about faith. If that's happened to you, but it's not, it hasn't. You had to wait, stay in faith, not give up. Having done all to stand, stand. And even though that farmer knows that harvest is coming and he already knows what period of time to expect it between mid-July and mid-August or something, he, he, he knows he still has to be patient as he's waiting for it. Can you say amen? amen? Now, he says in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Now I want you to keep that definition that I gave you from the Noah Webster dictionary about appointed time, a decreed time. Keep that in your thinking because we're going to come back to that. I don't always know when due season will come. But I do know it will come. Amen. Amen. It will come because that's what God said. There's no doubt about it. Now let's add to the equation that definition I gave you for appointed time from the Noah Webster dictionary, a decreed time. Now here's what that means. A decreed time in the Bible is a predetermined time set by God and Him alone. In other words, I can't 
set this decreed time, particularly where due season is concerned, I can't just come up with a time that I would like for it to happen. It is a predetermined time that God and God alone can set. It is a time in which only He can establish. God reserves the right to determine the time for due season. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, He changeth the times and the seasons. He changeth the times and the seasons. One commentary says, He orders events as He desires and at His prerogative. Another commentary says, He does this so that He might show that He's in total control. And still another commentary says, He has the power to change what deems necessary. He has the power to change what deems necessary. That's the reason He reserves the right to change the times and the seasons. It's at His discretion. Can you say amen? amen? When God spoke through Brother Copeland and said 2019 would be a year of abundant harvest, then He gave us a decreed time, a time frame that we can fix our faith upon. And I have my faith fixed upon it. I'm no longer having to wonder when due season will happen. Hallelujah. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to walk out of here today and I'm going to do it for the rest of this year. I'm going to decree what the prophet said because I believe the prophet and I will prosper. Hallelujah. And I'm saying, I'm telling everybody to come, out, come in contact with, this is my year for abundant harvest. I said, this is my year for abundant harvest. Look at somebody say, this is my year for abundant harvest. Not just harvest, but abundant harvest. Can you give God a good shout in advance? Now, do you remember the story in 2 Kings chapter 7? And it begins in verse 1. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Listen to this. Hear ye the word of the Lord. This is being spoken out of the prophet Elijah's, Elijah's mouth. A prophet. Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Notice God told the prophet to say, tomorrow, at this same time. In other words, God put a time frame on it, and the prophet spoke it. He set the appointed time. He set the due season through a word decreed out of the prophet's mouth. Amen. Now, what if Brother Copeland had said, tomorrow, everybody in here that's a sower of seed will have an abundant harvest. I wonder how many would believe it. Well, that must have been something he ate. But if God inspired him to say it, and brother, all day long, all night long, I probably wouldn't even go to bed tonight. I'd be talking about my harvest. I'd be shouting about my harvest. In fact, I'd be making preparation for my harvest. I'm already about to write some checks. Hallelujah. <laughs> making provision for the harvest. Amen. Well, he didn't say tomorrow, but he did say this year. Look at your neighbor and say this year. This year. How many of you want an abundant harvest? Yeah. I certainly do, praise God. And I'm, I'm going for it. I don't know what the rest of you are going to do, but I'm going for it. You're going to hear me talking about this all year long, everywhere I go. This is my year for abundant harvest, and I'm ready for marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations. In fact, I am open to surprises. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord your best shout. Amen. 
God decreed through the mouth of the prophet and said, tomorrow this is going to happen. And you read the story and you'll find it happened exactly the way God decreed it through the mouth of his prophet. He predestined, even though in the natural, the city of Samaria had been cut off from all supplies. There was not anybody in there in that city at that moment that had anything to eat, not even the rich. They certainly didn't have anything to sell. They were waiting to die. But the prophet spoke, this time tomorrow. And some folks didn't believe it. And the folks that didn't believe it didn't enjoy the fruit of it. I'm a believer. Somebody shout, I'm a believer. I believe this year is my year for abundant harvest. Hallelujah. And those that believed it, they enjoyed the fruit of it. And how did God make that word come to pass, that prophetic word come to pass? It was a marvel. It was a wonder. It was an extraordinary manifestation of the greatness of God. He took lepers who were ready to die. They're not even allowed in the city. They're out on the outskirts, ready to die. And then one of them said to the others, why sit we here till we die? If we're going to die anyway, let's die doing something. Let's die on the move. So they got up and started toward the enemy's camp. Lepers, what could they possibly do to change the situation in Samaria? They were about to die. But God is the God of wonders. God's the God of marvels, hallelujah. And he used the least likely to bring about a major breakthrough. Don't ever count somebody out just because they don't look like they're capable. I've had some of my greatest financial breakthroughs, God using people that look like didn't have two quarters to rub together. I'm so glad I didn't say, oh God, can't you find somebody else? Some of my greatest financial breakthroughs have come through people that in the natural didn't look like they were capable of doing it. Amen. Amen. And God used these lepers and they started marching toward the enemy's camp and God magnified the sound of their footsteps. And it sounded like an entire army and it frightened the enemy. So they just took off, left everything that at the camp, left all the food, left all the, the weapons, left all the, 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 the goods. And when those lepers came in there and saw there was no one here, they began to partake. Then they said, well, it's not right that we enjoy this ourselves. So they went and told the city of Samaria. And this time tomorrow came to pass and God did it through marvels, wonders and extraordinary manifestations. Can you say amen? amen. Lift your hands right now and say, Lord, Lord I am open, I open for however you want to do it. I believe this is my year for abundant harvest. However you want to bring it to pass, I am open and I'm praising you in advance for it. Come on, give him another great shout, a great shout. Amen. I, I had the privilege, what was it, Jerry, last week? Last week, I went back to Shreveport, Louisiana, where Carol and I grew up. Uh, we, we grew up on the same street. I've known Carolyn since I was about 11 and she was nine. And uh, when my parents moved on that street where she and her parents already lived, the, the day that they were unloading our furniture and everything to move in that house, 
uh, when they got my bicycle off the trailer, I got on it and took off down the road to check out the new neighborhood. My first day in this new neighborhood. And Carolyn and her sister were out playing church. Carolyn was the preacher and her sister was the singer, the praise and worship leader. <laughs> Do you have your baby dolls lined up out there? They're preaching to their baby dolls and singing to their baby dolls and all. And I didn't know this. Thank God I didn't know it. I'd have talked my mother and daddy into moving if I'd have known it. But because I didn't know it. And she said that when I rode by, God told her, there's the man you're going to marry and you're going to preach the gospel. She went and told her mother, I just saw the man I'm going to marry. The boy I'm going to marry. The boy I'm going to marry. I didn't know that. Now we grew up together, went to school together. I dated her best friend. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I was like one of the first on our road to have a car. And so I would pick up some of the other kids and drive them to school. And sometimes, uh, like my senior year in high school, I, I would go pick up Carolyn and drive her to my girlfriend's house. <laughs> pick up my girlfriend, Carolyn get in the back seat, my girlfriend moving in the front seat. And then when school was out, I'd drop my girlfriend off and then I'd take Carolyn to her house, you know. I'm going to write a book someday and call it, I Married the Girl in the Backseat. <laughs> That'd be a good book, wouldn't it? Amen. And so anyway, uh, later when I was in my second year of college, I came home one weekend and uh, my, my buddies that I grew up with, we had made a pact that after we graduated from high school, two years later on a certain date, we were all going to come back to Shreveport and have a, a, a get together and just talk about what we're doing now and, and so forth. And we were going to meet at the Carousel Lounge. And uh, so that's where I was headed that night. And I wanted to stop at the car wash to, to wash my 57 Chevrolet because I was so proud of that car. It was one hot car. And uh, so I stopped at the car wash and ran into Carolyn. And I hadn't seen her in two years. She's now a senior in high school and I'm in my second year of college. And when I saw her, I thought, is this the same kid that lived down the street? She's changed. <laughs> and so we just talked for a few moments and didn't really think anything about it, you know. And uh, I said, well, what are your plans when you get out of high school? She said, I'm, I'm going to a Bible college and so forth. And we didn't talk a whole lot about that because when she said that, I really didn't want to be around her anymore. <laughs> and so she got in her car and she took off down Hearn Avenue. I got in my car and I'm supposed to go to Hearn Avenue, down Hearn Avenue, but I'm supposed to go straight and then get on Uri Drive and so forth and show up at the... Found, I mean, the uh, uh, carousel lounge. And Carolyn turned to the left. And I turned to the left. And she then turned to the right. And I turned to the right. Then she turned to the left and went into a, a driveway. I pulled in behind her. She said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, why are you following me? I said, I don't know. I said, who lives here? She said, some friends of mine that I go to church with and, and we're, we're going to, uh, we, we plan to meet and I think they were having a Bible study and they were going witnessing and so forth. And, and I said, well, would you like to go with me? And she said, well, let me go tell my friends. So on the way, I'm thinking Carousel Lounge, maybe she'd like to go to the Carousel Lounge and found out real quick that she doesn't go to places like that. So he went to the Dairy Queen and had malts and burgers. And she's talking to me about, she's going to Bible school. She's going to be a missionary. She's going to Africa. And I thought, how can a person lose their mind in just two years? Why would anybody want to do that? And I was going to a party college. I lived in an apartment off campus that had become a casino. 
And uh, so I took her back to her friends and I got in my car and I got to the carousel lounge and they all asked me, why are you late? And I said, you don't want to know. So I thought I'm, that'd be done with Carolyn. I'll never think about her again. I couldn't get her off my mind. And now I'm skipping class and coming home in the middle of the day to come see her. I just, I just show up at the high school and she say, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and then finally I realized I'm falling in love with this girl. And wasn't long after just a few dates, you know, I asked her to marry me. And she graduated in May of 1966, and we were married in July of 1966. Amen. Now, she had told me the night before the wedding that she made a vow to God that whoever she married, that he would be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, preach the gospel, and go to Africa. I said, you're married to the wrong man. I'm not doing any of that. I said, if you marry me, I'd already had my, I already knew what I was going to, I'm going to own an automotive business. I'm going to restore classic cars. I'm going to build hot rods and I'm going to race automobiles just like my daddy. And if you marry me, you're going to spend the rest of your life on a racetrack. She said, you don't know the power of intercessory prayer. I said, I had never even heard of it. I don't know what it is. She said, you just go in there tomorrow night and tell the man when he says, do you take this woman? All you have to do is say, I do. And me and God will take care of the rest. <laughs> so anyway, the rest is history. <laughs> so I went back to Shreveport last week to Life Tabernacle where Kenneth Copeland came for the first time, preached a week there, three services a day. Carolyn didn't miss a service and begging me to go when I'd come home from my shop every night and I wouldn't go. And finally, the last night he was there, she said, would you go tonight? And if you don't like him, I will never ask you to go to another service. I said, you promise? I said, that's the deal I've been waiting on. You mean I don't ever have to go to church with you again if I don't like him? No, I will never ask you again. I thought, okay, I'm going. So I went and took a shower and put on some clean clothes and and then I thought about the name she said, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. I know that name. I said, I know who he is. She said, how would you know who Kenneth Copeland is? You don't go to church. I said, well, in 1957, there was a man on the radio named Kenneth Copeland who had a hit record called The Pledge of Love. It's in the top 20. I listened to the radio all the time. I knew all the songs, knew who recorded them knew of the words. I even sung some of the lines to her. She said, it's not him. <laughs> I said, I'm going for two reasons tonight. Number one, if I don't like him, I'll never have to go again. Number two, as soon as he gets through preaching, I'm going to ask him if he's the same man. I'd like to be right one time. <laughs> so I got to the service and I sat right on the back row closest to the door because the moment I don't like him, I'm leaving. And uh, so we get there and he's sitting on the platform. Of course, I don't know which one he is. There's several guys on the platform. I said, which one is this Kenneth Copeland? She pointed him out. I won't go into all the other story, but she pointed him out. And so when they finally turned the service to him, uh, he's into his message called the word of faith. I still have that old reel-to-reel -reel tape. And 15 minutes into his service, he just stopped. He said, now I don't know why I'm saying this. It has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon tonight, but I guess somebody in here needs to hear it. Back in 1957, I had a hit record on the radio called The Pledge of Love. <laughs> I was headed for rock and roll stardom and mama prayed it out of me. And when he said that, I knew that he said it for me and it got my attention. And I sat on the edge of my chair for the rest of the service, hearing the Bible preached like I'd never heard it before. That changed my life. Amen. Changed my life. Now, I said all that to say that we went back last week and we were filming because it's my 50th anniversary. And, uh, I sat in the very seat 
where I sat that night that Kenneth Copeland said all those things. And then I told the story. They're filming it. And then he came back a second time. Now, by this second time, I've surrendered my life to the Lord. And I'm preparing for ministry. I've even been out doing some youth meetings here and there and so forth. And I'm ministering to young people and hippies and drug addicts and all in my city. And so he came back the second time. And the second time he came, and I sat in a different seat, because that first time I'm on the back row, can hardly wait to get out. By the time he came back the second time, I had moved up to the front, front row. I'm a front row Christian now. <laughs> I could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. And uh, he began to prophesy over me. Now I'll take it back. I sat on the third row about where Billy Rash is sitting right there. And Brother Copeland's preached along there and then he just stopped. He said, Jerry, stand up. So I stood up. I didn't have a clue what he's going to do or say. He said, I was in prayer today and God showed me that you and I will be a team and we will spend the rest of our lives together preaching the Word of God all over the world. And it'll be your responsibility to believe God for the perfect timing for the team to begin. Sit down. <laughs> I leaned over to Carol and I said, what did all that mean? She said, I think we're moving to Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> I said, what do you mean by a team? She said, I think you're going to wind up preaching with Kenneth Copeland. I thought, wow, that was awesome. You know, so, you know, we didn't move right away. And uh, now I'm out, you know, preaching here and there. And then he came back a third time. And uh, we, we had an opportunity to get a little better acquainted. And then I'm in Oklahoma City and he's in, headed to Jacksonville, Florida. And he calls my house and says, where's Jerry? And Carolyn said, he's in Oklahoma City. When's he coming home? He'll be home tonight. Tell him to meet me in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. So we drove down to Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And that's when the team began. Now I'm in Shreveport last week telling all these stories, filming it, and I'm sitting in the very seats where all this happened. And boy, did it bring back some fond memories. Terry, you were there a couple of times. I remember Terry just when she's about 11 years old coming. And uh, uh, it brought back some great memories. Now, what I'm saying is this. He prophesied that he and I would be a team. Well, I could have took that and just said, well, that's not likely. Oh. How could that ever happen? But we've been a team now for almost 50 years. Who, what two preachers you know today have that kind of relationship? Wow. Amen. In fact, the Lord told me when Carol and I were in Australia in March, he said, when you get home, you call Brother Copeland, tell him 2019, will be your 50th year in the ministry and you go back to your roots and tell him you're going to go back and serve him and go wherever he wants you to go and do whatever he wants you to do and tell him and wherever you go with him, tell him it's a seed. You don't want to be paid for it. You're just going to go back to your roots and the team is hooking up again. Now we've been preaching together all these years, but I'm, I'm going back to be with him like I was in those early days. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh yeah, there it is. That's the very seat I was sitting on when uh, Kenneth Copeland came the very first time. You have any of those other pictures? Is that the door? Yeah, that's the door. <laughs> I'm close to the door. See, the moment I don't like him, I'm leaving. I told Carolyn, you can get home best way you can. She said, if that's what it takes to get you there. Amen. Amen. So what I'm, what I'm endeavoring to emphasize is every word inspired by God that he has prophesied over me has come to pass. So why would I not choose to believe when the prophet says 2019 will be a year of abundant harvest? I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be standing in this place if his word couldn't be depended upon. It was a decreed word from God. 
that created an appointed time, a due season. Can you say amen? amen. Now, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Two years ago, 2017, Brother Copeland was really, he'd, he'd really got settled on uh, uh, the, the international jet that he believed God wanted him to have. And of course, Jesse and I and some others that was introduced this morning were on the board, you know, and, and he informs us of all this and so forth. And so we went out to the airport to look at this airplane and uh, he was still praying about it afterwards. He hadn't made any final decision at that point. And so I was led of the Lord because the airplane that I uh, currently own, uh, it won't take me internationally. And uh, I spend more time internationally than most preachers who do have international jets. In fact, actually, I go internationally more than Brother Copeland. I go more than Brother Jesse. I've been traveling internationally for 41 of my 50 years. I have offices in a number of different nations, Bible schools, churches, staff. And so if anybody needed an international jet, it's Jerry Savell. <laughs> I've paid my dues. I haven't complained when I've got on American Airlines or any other of these airlines, I've been obedient to God, but I knew that one day, this is not the way I'm going to spend the rest of my life traveling around the world. I was willing to do it. I paid my dues, haven't complained. <laughs> I'm not better than anybody else. But God told me when I first went to ministry, you will not be able to fulfill what you're called to do without airplanes. And then he added this, and don't you ever fly an airplane that's got debt on it. I want you to believe God, believe me for debt-free airplanes. Amen. So I'm not done yet. And it seems like the international thing has even picked up more. So if there was anybody that ever needed and the right time for an international jet, it'd be Jerry Savelle and the time is now. Amen. 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 Now, I was led of the Lord in 2017 because I know Brother Copeland knows how to believe for debt-free airplanes. So I was led of the Lord to sow $100,000 into the airplane that he was believing for. So I sowed $100,000. And then last year, no, that, that was early part of 2017. And then in August of 2017, during the Believers Convention here in Fort Worth, I was led of the Lord on Thursday night after I preached to sow another quarter of a million dollars into his international jet. So that's $350,000 just in that one project. Now I'm sowed seed in, in other people's international jets. And I've been believing for mine. It's time. I said, it's time. I, I'm not done. When, when I, I had that stroke, a full blown stroke, I couldn't, I lost use of my right arm, lost use of my right leg partially, uh, total memory loss. Didn't even know my family. Couldn't think of one scripture, one sermon I'd ever preached. Couldn't recognize anybody. They'd put a child's coloring book in front of me and tell me, what is that? Point at pictures of leaves and birds and dogs. I didn't have a clue what they were. Total memory loss. And God supernaturally healed me. Do I look like a man who had a full-blown stroke? Supernaturally healed me. And within three weeks, I was traveling around the world again, praise God. And I hadn't let up since. Carolyn says, is this what you call slowing down? I just turned 72 and I feel like I'm 42. I've been hanging around Copeland. <laughs> Brother Copeland, amen. And it's picked up. 
There's more demand on me internationally today than ever. So it's not just because I'm on a, I'm on an international airplane. I'm not trying to show off. It's a tool. Amen. And so I've sold $350,000 into his airplane. Now he's flying it. And when I heard the word decreed out of the mouth of the prophet that 2019 is the year of the abundant harvest, I began to shout. I said, I began to shout. And I'm saying without any, without any reservation, without any reluctancy, without any fear, this is the year my international jet will manifest. Hallelujah. This year. If it's the year of the abundant harvest, why not? And I believe I'm this close. Hallelujah. Now, if you believe it, and I learned this a long time ago, if you believe it, then you have to act like it. Faith without corresponding actions is void of power. So the very first airplane God blessed me with back in 1975, that was nine debt-free airplanes ago. The Lord asked me one day, do you really believe you have an airplane? I said, yes, I do. He said, why aren't you acting like it? I said, well, Lord, how does one act like he has an airplane? Go get out on the runway? I mean, <laughs> how do you act like you have an airplane? He said, well, you could accept more of the invitations that you've been turning down. Because I was driving everywhere. And he said, you could accept all the invitations that you've been turning down. I said, well, Lord, they want me in Los Angeles one night and they want me in Miami the next. You can't drive there and get to those meetings on time. He said, then go ahead and set up your itinerary as though you can. So the man that handled my scheduling back then, I said, Charles, you write back and accept every invitation that comes into this office. Book me up so tight, there's absolutely no way I can drive. He looked at me and he thought, dear Lord, are you serious? I said, yes. And he did. And th I thought, well, I got to schedule now. Zowie. You would think an airplane would show up that night. It didn't. Now I got to fulfill all this because I'm not in the habit of breaking commitments. So I had to, you know, back then it was Love Field. I had to go over to Love Field, Dallas, and fly as far as I could because some of the cities I accepted invitations to didn't even have airports. And I'd have to rent a car and drive somewhere, you know. And so, man, it was day and night, day and night. I'd come home 2 o'clock in the morning, go in and kiss my wife, kiss my daughters, drop that suitcase off, get another one, and head out just to make all these meetings. I said, Lord... You told me I needed to act like I had an airplane. I did. Where's the airplane? He said, well, son, where are you going to keep it? You can't keep it at your house. I said, no, I'm going to keep it at the airport. He said, do you have a hangar? I said, well, no. He said, well, why don't you have a hangar? I said, well, I'm waiting on the airplane. I, he said, I thought you said you believed you had an airplane. I said, I do. He said, well, where are you going to keep it? I said, at the airport in a hangar. Do you have a hangar? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, well, I'm waiting for the airplane to manifest. He said, I thought you said you had an airplane. <laughs> you don't argue with God. You're going to lose. So I went out to Meacham Field. I'd never been out to Meacham Field. Well, I'll take it back. I'd been out there with Brother Copeland, but I didn't know anybody out there. I didn't know where you could even, where you'd even talk to people about a hangar. So they, one person directed me here and there, and I finally got up to this guy that rented hangers. I said, sir, I need a hanger. He said, fill out an application. Jerry Seville, Jerry Seville Ministries. Put the address, put the phone number. What type aircraft? Blank. N number, blank. T 
type of airplane? Blank. Single, twin, multi, you know, turbo, jet, blank. Then I signed it and gave it back to him. He said, you didn't fill out the application totally. I said, I put in there all in you. He said, well, what kind of airplane do you have? I said, I don't know. He said, you don't know what kind of airplane you have? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, uh, do you own it? I said, oh yeah, I own it. <laughs> but you don't even know what kind it is? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, is it single engine, twin engine, turbo, jet? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, you actually own this airplane? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Faith is the title deed. <laughs> well, he, he, I'm not getting anywhere with him. And he says, sir, we don't rent hangers out to people that don't know what kind of airplane they have. <laughs> Not only that, there's a waiting list. And even if you knew what kind of airplane you had, I can't give you a hanger today. I said, I got to have one today. He said, there's a waiting list. I said, I can't wait. He said, why not? I said, God told me to come and get a hanger. God told you? I said, yes. God told me. He said, uh, well, does God know what kind of airplane you have? <laughs> I said, I believe he does, but he hasn't told me yet. <laughs> he said, well, sir, why don't you come back when you know what God knows and we'll give you a hanger. But you'll have to be on a waiting list. I said, sir, that won't work. You have to give me a hanger today. He said, I can't give you a hanger today. There are people who know what kind of airplane they have that are waiting for a hanger. He got up to, you know, shake hands with me and dismiss me. So I took my little New Testament and read some scriptures to him about faith and all, and he still didn't get it. And I said, uh, okay, I'm leaving. But can you live with the fact that if you die and go to heaven and God asks you, why didn't you give Jerry Savelle a hanger? And you prevented me from getting an airplane because you wouldn't give me a hand. Can you live with that? He said, no, sir, I'm going to give you mine. Sign right here. <laughs> he gave me his hanger, George. And within two weeks, my first airplane manifested debt free. Hallelujah. Amen. So I brought up that story to tell you this one. I keep my airplane out at Spinks on the south side of Fort Worth. I was the first jet that ever ha was housed on that airport when they began to expand. It used to be Oak Grove where Brother Copeland had his first airplane many years ago. Then they expanded it and they turned it into Spinks because it's named after Happy Spinks, uh, the guy that was involved in aviation there. And I was the first jet years ago on that airport and they took my jet as leverage to go to the city to get more money wow. to expand the airport. Then they started building hangars out there. Well, for a season, I had my plane out here at, at Brother Copeland's hangar. And uh, then when he got the, the G5, uh, somebody's airplane had to go. <laughs> and rather than they forced me out, I volunteered. And I knew it was coming, you know, when it had to make room for that. So I moved my plane back to Spinks. And the day that we decided to do that, a hangar opened for me. Now I've been telling them, and I'm telling them even stronger now because they've been hearing me say for quite some time now, I will have a Falcon 50 EX here. I will house a Falcon 50 EX here. They don't have a hangar big enough to hold a Falcon 50. So they're building one. Yeah. Hey. I'm making provision. Amen. Isn't that the way you do it, Bill? You make provision for what you believe is coming to pass. So they're building a huge hangar and they have assured me that half of that hangar will be mine. Hallelujah. Well, they better get it built soon because 2019 is the year of the abundant harvest. Hallelujah. 
Can you say amen? amen? If you believe it, stand to your feet and give your best shout to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God is working on something. And I believe it involves my harvest. I'm making provision for abundant harvest this year. Jesus. I believe I receive it. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord another good shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The decreed time has been spoken. So let's run with it. Can you say amen? Let's run with it. And let me just close it with this. If what I just preached is from the Bible and I showed you where it is, then I would strongly urge you to get all the seed in the ground this year that you possibly can. Amen. Amen. Get all the seed in the ground this year that you possibly can and rejoice every time you sow it and decree this is my year for the abundant harvest. Come on, give the Lord one more good praise. Hallelujah. Come on out.